For the story, how would you like me to refer to you as far as your name goes? Michaela. Okay. Yeah. So, right off the bat, what is microdosing? So, microdosing is ingesting psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms, in really sub-perceptual doses. So, a dose that would give you like a classic psychedelic effect would be anywhere between a gram to five, six, seven grams. And so, a microdose is a fraction of a gram. So, a tenth of a gram, 0.1 grams of the mushroom or 100 milligrams is considered a microdose. Anywhere between 0.1 and 1 gram is what would give you this kind of underglow without fully taking you into a psychedelic experience. What does it feel like? A glow, you know, an underglow. Um, so what's really happening with psilocybin is that an opening of the, of the sensory perceptional field and so you're seeing things at a higher visual acuity so colors are more vibrant you know the 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 contrast between the leaf and the sky is a lot more um, contrast is heightened um, you are also seeing the sensation of things like breathing or moving or being alive in a sense so this is just an increase in your sensory awareness of things so things might sound a little clearer to you i notice too while i'm microdosing and mothering my availability of emotions you know my availability to cry and my availability to laugh is a lot more um, at the surface. So for some people, they feel that that's an alleviation of depression symptoms. But what we're really experiencing is just an increased sensitivity to the world around us. How long have you been microdosing? I've been microdosing since I was four months pregnant. And so that is about a little more than two years now. And why did you start? I, I started actually because I found that moving into my pregnancy, I was struggling with alcoholism. So alcoholism runs in my family, many generations, and that was something I didn't want to bring in into my pregnancy. It's something I really wanted to face head on and clear before my child came into the world because I grew up in an alcoholic family and that was really challenging. Uh, for a lot of reasons and so that was like my primary motivation was I mean I've heard that psilocybin mushrooms can help combat um, addictive behavioral patterns and so I kind of wanted to approach it head-on and move my alcoholism and my unconscious use of alcohol into maybe mindfully um, reaching into psilocybin and other uh, materials of the earth to you know deal with what I was dealing with underneath which was unresolved trauma now as a mom your son is two and a half yeah how does it help you like i said it makes those emotions to connect with my son and toddler way more readily available and it slows down my desire to react and instead i respond to him you know it really slows down and helps me like get on floor level with him and understand and might be able to see how he's feeling things from his perspective, as opposed to just my perspective and my view of the way that he's acting. Him throwing things on the floor and him tossing the laundry around is not about him being mischievous. It's about him discovering his world and I can respond to him in a better way. So it slows everything down. It gets me to actually want to sing like the Pixar songs with him, you know, and it, it helps me connect to like my inner child and, I definitely had a lot of depression and anxiety before as a young person and having a child and becoming pregnant and going through the birth experience can intensify those feelings and so even after he was born I felt that kind of postpartum depression start to creep in you know and so it totally changed the game for me like I felt like I was not a victim of the circumstance of motherhood, but instead could have like a good deal of agency and pave a way for my family that was like a happy one and one that was rooted in connection and not, I just want him to be in daycare because I don't want to be a mom anymore. How often do you do it? Oh, 
Um, well, when I was pregnant, I, I wanted to do it every time I felt like I wanted to have a drink. That was kind of the alternative. Because like I said, I was dealing with these feelings of, I wanted to reach for alcohol, right? And not just because I was sad, but because that's what we do socially. You know, like I'm at a music event. Music is a big part of my life. So I would go to a concert pre-COVID, like you could go to concerts and, you know, everyone's drinking and that is the social lubricant. And so instead of that, I chose to microdose instead. And that actually surprisingly altered the spaces I wanted to be in because, oh wow, maybe a loud crowded room <laughs> was actually not where I wanted to be, but the alcohol made me numb to the sensations of the space that made me feel uncomfortable. So going out to concerts actually changed. I actually wanted to maybe go to the beach instead or go on a hike instead. And actually because my sensory awareness was so heightened, it changed the shape of how I even wanted to socialize in the world. So I was dosing maybe once a week at that time. And then as I got into the postpartum period, I realized maybe I needed a little bit more support. So. Some of the protocols I followed was um, like one day of dosing and then the next day I wouldn't and then I would go every other day. And I noticed as my symptoms started to improve and like these feelings of like helplessness started to change, I actually needed it less and less. And I now take longer gaps in between my usage because the effects are, are semi-permanent. Like, I feel like I don't need it as much anymore. As you know, being pregnant, there's so many rules. Yes. Or so-called rules with what you can eat, what you can totally. drink, what you can't eat, what you can't drink. <laughs> Were those concerns for you when you started microdosing while pregnant? So I think that's a great question because there is so much stigma placed on moms about anything they choose to do, even listening to like certain kinds of music while you're pregnant, right? Um, that'll hurt the baby. Like you can't even pick up something like that'll hurt the baby. So, you know, of course, of course I was facing that. I was also facing it within my own family. I have a partner, I have a fiance of seven years and like I had to work with this with him and say, no, in my, in my gut, I'm feeling like this could be really helpful for me. And I also need to reach out to someone for permission. So, I'm grateful in that I have a connection to a community elder that has had a long life relationship with these mushrooms. She comes from a tribe in Mexico where psilocybin mushrooms are offered to their children as young as three years old. So that's my son in six months, right? So this is a very different worldview and this is a a way of thinking that's not very common here in the United States, that children are old enough and robust enough to imbibe in these other medicines. Like you were, you know, we've spoken about in Europe, like alcohol, wine. I'm also Italian. We had our first drink of wine at age nine at the dinner table because this is customary. This is part of actually introducing your children to these substances so they have knowledge and awareness as they come into their teenage years. So my contact with this point person, this, this abuelita, this abuela, this grandmother, who her first sit with this introduction to this medicine was at three years old. I said to her, I'm pregnant, I'm four months. I'm feeling the call to sit. What do I do? Is this appropriate? So she actually was the one who gave me permission. And many women don't have that kind of permission. They just have Google. And so, you know, I wanted to back that up. So I said, okay, I'm getting permission from a community elder. Now what's the science? Like what's here? What, you know, is research that's been done on psilocybin and pregnant mothers? And there actually is a piece of research. You'd have to pretty much eat your body weight in psilocybin mushrooms to cause any kind of toxicity. So the most a human being has ever taken is like about 50 to 100 grams at a single time which is a lot, right? A microdose is a tenth of a gram, right? And so, so little of that is making it into the breast milk that it's, it's inert, essentially, once it, it makes it in there. Although psilocybin is present in breast milk, it's a non-toxic agent for adults. 
in vast quantities. And so it's less toxic than aspirin, than caffeine, than nicotine, than morphine that's given in the epidural at the hospital. So we're looking at a substance just on the traditional side, right, is very well integrated. And then on the science side, pretty much inert as far as toxicity. If death is a toxic endpoint, it will not kill you. As you know, there's a stigma around drugs in general. 100%. But when you talk about mushrooms, yeah. what most people know about them, mm. they're hallucinogenics. Yeah. They're referred to as magic mushrooms. Right. How do you get around that stigma that doing this is bad and you're just a druggie or whatever term someone wants to use? Totally. And I think that those feelings of being a druggie or a, you know, a junkie is very much perpetuated by like the propaganda during the drug war. And also very much like the hippie revolution, like drop out, you know, tune in, like, you know, go live in a school bus or whatever. And like, that's very much not what's happening among microdosing mothers. I am seeing microdosing mothers be very involved in their communities, very much involved in their families. And what's leading people to want to dose is actually the desire to be more present in their life. And I think that totally, redefines what we think about as a drug user. They're characterized by this desire to escape. And yet, the, how I get around it, I see the mothers in the community, I see myself very much present in my family. And I see that reflected in how my mom views me as a mom, you know? She's like, you're doing a great job. I see other people like, you're doing great. Keep, keep it up, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm microdosing. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm seeking out these medicines of the earth that are very supportive for mothers. And so I'm at the farmer's market with my son. You know, we're buying this amazing produce, you know, and we're sitting in a lot of abundance and we're walking around and he's playing with kids and I'm there and I just took my dose you know, and I'm functioning and I drove us there and I'm communicating with other parents and I'm watching him and I'm watching other families drink booze, right? I'm seeing moms like have a beer. I'm seeing dads have a glass of wine. And the question to me is, is like, what makes us so different? You know, we're just being here for our family in the ways that we know how and in ways that somehow make us a better person or can help us be better people. So I feel like the stigma is so like concentrated in the mind because of propaganda and not the reality. The reality is very, very different. But the reality is what you're doing is illegal. Yeah. On its path to decriminalization. So what I will say is like legalization and criminalization, criminality is a very fluid thing. It's something that's ever evolving as research, right? As testimony, as these experiences and stories come forward. And so even in different pockets within California, um, psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms, and some of these other plant medicines like ayahuasca, um, and not always peyote because of conservation issues, they're becoming decriminalized in different regions. So in Santa Cruz, they're decriminalized. In Oakland, they're decriminalized. So I'm going to a local cafe in Oakland, and on the table is a bar of chocolate that's got mushrooms in it, and no one's like, and no one no one's blinking you know an eye about it because it's so normalized in that community to have access and to openly talk about it so i feel like here in san diego and in other parts of california and in other parts of the nation we're just slow to accept and we are coming into that the same way that we came into cannabis however many of us in the movement would not like to seek legalization we'd like to see decriminalization and there is a difference okay so tell me about the difference and also what it is that you're doing because obviously you're open to speaking about this you go on your social media mm -hmm. you're open to sharing your stories mm -hmm. um, there's an end in sight for you as yeah. far as decriminalizing what you're doing totally for others it's it's so it's so necessary for some of us to be out and forward because we need to move the needle we need to help give permission to other mothers. We need to give permission to fathers and other families and you know, family units that they don't have to suffer, that there are um, treatments, right, that come from the soil 
that can help alleviate symptoms of depression and anxiety better than SSRIs or any pharmaceuticals without the side effects. And because it comes from nature, right, there's every reason why this should be integrated into our society. This, this medicine got lumped in and criminalized as part of a movement to, as part of a government sanctioned mass incarceration initiative. So there's many people in jail just for cannabis when people make millions on cannabis right now which is a strange paradox mm -hmm. that some people are being warehoused behind bars and on the other side of it, these folks that are highly invested and have tons of capital are making money on cannabis. So for me, decriminalizing and coming forward is part of just putting my neck on the line for families I know benefit from this and to not just speak to the choir. People know in my community how helpful this is and we all, sit with this medicine and eat it and like we know what it is and protect each other but having the opportunity to tell like the public that this is not a dangerous molecule that this is a mo molecule that's very helpful is like reaching an audience that it's such an honor it's such an important thing to get the person at home who's just heard about this to know that normal people you know, just like a mother, just like the person who's working at the supermarket or even like the, the kindergarten teacher. Are more people doing this than the general public would assume? <laughs> In our neck of the woods, everybody, like everybody is sitting with this mushroom. Everyone has a relationship. And that just might be indicative of who I'm spending time with. So more people than you could possibly imagine have an in the closet relationship with mushrooms. And would it be people you don't expect? And when I say this, um, I think yes. people in society can look at someone <laughs> yeah. and assume that person uses marijuana or right. that person does this or that person does this. Would you say that these stigmas are, um, there is no stigma when it comes to mushrooms, in other words, you know, the CEO that goes to work in her suit versus the stay-at-home mom that's in her sweats and lighting incense, are they both doing mushrooms? 100%. It's, it's ubiquitous, so it's amazing. Like, the variety of people who have their lives touched by mushrooms is as vast as the people on the globe. I mean, like you said, like the microdosing CEO of Silicon Valley has a relationship with mushrooms and the sweatpants mom at the park has a relationship with mushrooms and the um, kindergarten teacher who's teaching your children have a relationship with mushrooms and the head of your local hospital, you know. These are actually people that I know for a fact because I know them, they are my friends. These are the positions in our community that they hold and they have a relationship with mushrooms. So you know exactly what I mean when I talk about the different types of people. It's yeah. what we as society will stigmatize different people based on how they look or how they dress or what their job is. Totally. Are you microdosing right now? I'm not on a dose right now today, um, but I microdosed yesterday. Okay. And um, this, this term microdosing, it's kind of this ongoing relationship you know, um, having a relationship with mushrooms or like eating the mushroom or having a relationship, right? Microdosing is just one way that you can approach the mushroom. So just, it just means taking a small dose of it. A lot of people are on specific protocols where they do one day on, two days off. This is called the James Fadiman protocol. There's also a Paul Stamets protocol that looks different. There's one day on, one day off. That's a microdosing institute um, protocol. So there's all these different protocols. But for some of us, we take a more like intu an intuitive approach. We're like, I could use a boost today, you know? Or I've been in a rut. You know, I, I wanna kind of go into myself and discover what's there and maybe do some journaling or go out hiking with our child and get an answer or to be revealed something, um, make a slight adjustment, and then we might not microdose again for like many weeks even. As a mom or even as a person, yeah. where would you be without microdosing? Oh my gosh. I mean, without the, without the mushroom in general, like before I met the mushroom and learned about microdosing and just learned about dosing in general, I was suicidal and an alcoholic. 
and I, I actually had like no sense of identity and purpose and was very much involved in the, the over culture or like what I was being told I should be like from magazines and social media even, you know? I was very much influenced by the world around me in this, this is how you need to be in order to be a happy person. And was seeking out my version of happiness in other people's versions of happiness. But when I, I found the mushroom and I found microdosing and I just listened to and applied their original instructions, sometimes it'll just feel like an epiphany or just like a, I feel like I already should have known that, but now I know it and applied that into my life. I'm a vastly different person for the better. I had no idea that this level of happiness and contentment in life would be possible before I found the mushroom. And um, I was clinically depressed seeing therapists and no one knew how to help me. And the truth is no one could, I had to help myself. <laughs> Going back to the de decriminalizing mushrooms. Is yeah. there an active push in San Diego County right now? Um, so thankfully there's a great movement called Decriminalize Nature and I think that's such a great name because we forget that these drugs are not just drugs like they're components of the natural world. Cannabis will grow wild, mushrooms will pop up out of cow patties wild and you know these are just things we run into in the world and decriminalize nature means to make our relationship with the planet whole again that there's some parts of nature that shouldn't be in our possession and there's some that are okay to be. So in Southern California decriminalized nature has um, worked on the city level and so helps to give cities all the paperwork necessary in order to move a decriminalized initiative forward. So there's decriminalized nature in Santa Monica and it looks like we're going to maybe start one here in San Diego and we'll see, um, we'll see what it looks like. There's also another bill being pushed forward across the entire state of California called SB 519 and it is essentially a decriminalizing initiative as well, but it's on a state level. So that's huge. I mean, that would change the face of everything that we do. Mothers can feel safe. Families can feel safe knowing that them finding the mushrooms, encapsulating it themselves or sharing it among each other is not a criminal offense. And that's really important. This should get decategorized. It shouldn't be a schedule one drug. There's no reason that it should be. It's never killed anyone actually. Do you feel safe talking to me, talking in front of our cameras about this? I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel safe. And at least I didn't feel like this was purposeful enough to go into an edge that felt even a little bit unsafe, right. you know? Um, Cause it is really important with the cannabis movement that was, you know, cannabis moms, I think actually started to turn the tide a little bit, as you said, like change the vision of who is smoking weed or who is eating edibles. And it like moved into domesticity. It moved into, no, it's everyone. And there's, there's everything okay about having a relationship with cannabis and like, look at where we are now. You can go to your local corner dispensary over 21 years old and anyone can go get cannabis now. And so I would like to see not a legalization initiative, but a decriminalization initiative in that I can cultivate in my house and I can make my own medicine and I can share it out and no one's getting in trouble for that. And that's what's really important to me. I don't, we don't want big money interests like trying to take on psilocybin and sell it back to us at a premium. It's so easy to cultivate. It's so communal that I feel like that would really disrupt what's happening and the goodness of what's happening, which is everyone has access to mushrooms and no one is getting thrown into jail for it. Well, I have a feeling this won't be the last time we hear from you. I hope not. This is so important and it's so liberating and I just want to say thank you for giving this story like the time and the reverence that it really deserves. Well, I want to thank you for your transparency and I do want you to show me examples of mm -hmm. the forms yeah. that microdosing comes in or these mushrooms come in. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So. Let me um, pull out some examples of these forms that they would come in. So this okay. is actually um, pretty common. So your capsule, so you would put like a 0.1 to a 0.5 
um, gram amount of mushrooms and a lot of people are getting really smart with their microdosing and they're adding other medicinal mushrooms like lion's mane, mm. or cordyceps or chaga or even other um, adaptogens like ashwagandha. This is called stacking. So you're going to take your um, microdose alongside these other really helpful nootropic uh, mushrooms and adaptogenic plants to help increase the quality and the effect. So these capsules are really easy for most people. You could just throw them in your handbag. I literally just have them in my purse and, you know, take them as needed. The effects come on in about 45 minutes and they'll last for about three hours or so. And then that overall glow, that overall glow will kind of dissipate after that. Okay. So if not in the pill form, how else is it used yeah, so these are actually new. I'm really excited about <laughs> gummies. Um, so psilocybin gummies um, are actually becoming more and more popular and gelatin and vegan versions are coming out. So there's a lot of great small businesses that are centered around psilocybin, um, magic mushroom making products. And so this is a newer version of microdosing that I've been seeing. So those products, there's an underground business essentially. You have to know where to go, who to call to get it, if you don't make it yourself. Yeah. Um, and it's really lovely because they've found really smart and ingenious ways of getting around some of the like legal um, strongholds right now, like selling NFTs, for example, and like cryptocurrency has been a really big way of like how this commerce has been coming together. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And then chocolate, one of my favorites. So this is actually um, a chocolate that I make. This one doesn't have psilocybin in it, but it's just honey, ceremonial grade cacao and lion's mane inside. Okay. And um, a teaspoon, depending on how much you would want to put in here, a teaspoon would be like 0.15 or 0.3 or something like that. So this is this like making medicine at home kind of thing. Like no one's going to make medicine better than you for yourself, you know? Um, you have your intentions, you have your, you know, I'm praying for my family or like, I would like to be more playful for my son. And so I'm like weaving that in as I'm like cooking my medicine. So chocolate, cacao is another really popular way that you'll find microdoses and also larger doses too. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's also fascinating. Again, thank you for being willing to speak out about it. I don't have any other questions unless you do. So, um, yeah, that yeah. was great. Yeah, thank so you. Thank you for opening our eyes to mm -hmm. to this whole new world. It's um is it even new? <laughs>